My name is Avi Hoffman, and I want to thank Dr. Chaim Shaked in the University of Miami, Rabbi Mark Golub and the Jewish Broadcasting Service, the Sheen Center, for making it possible for Sherry and me to present this program here tonight. And I also want to thank the Fiorello LaGuardia High School for the Performing Arts for lending us some of their most talented students to help us tell this amazing tale. In his book, Dachau, The Harrowing of Hell, American medical officer Dr. Marcus J. Smith recounts his time in Germany caring for the survivors of the newly liberated concentration camp. I have conflicting emotions about leaving. It is strange to think that in the six weeks we have been here, I have met people I would cherish as lifelong friends under other circumstances. It is unlikely that we will meet again. The sadness of departure lies in the bitter foreknowledge of the permanence of separation and the frailty of memory. The frailty of memory. We are here, all of us, to combat the frailty of memory in ever more urgent times. And with that in mind, we are very proud to represent the Arnold Unger Foundation for Remembrance, bringing you the Dachau album, interfaith Holocaust program. Our vision is a world that promotes the acceptance of religious, social, and political diversity, and while doing so, honors our collective and individual memories. Today is Holocaust Remembrance Day, the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and also Divine Mercy Sunday. And Sherry and I are blessed to come to you as Jewish children of Holocaust survivors who have, by inheritance, serendipity, or perhaps divine intervention, been entrusted with the lessons of the Dachau album. And as such, we have become the shepherds of memory. This distinction also comes with an enormous responsibility to not only never forget, but to forever remember. To share the Dachau album with future generations, never again, is not just a lesson from the past, but a lesson for today and every day. When I was growing up, I was taught that six million Jews were murdered, my family among them. What I did not know and what I was not taught was that it was not only six million Jews. There were others, millions of others, Christians, Catholics, Muslims, homosexuals, the, the disabled, gypsies, and many other religious and political dissenters who were arrested, enslaved in concentration camps, tortured, and killed. I was also never taught that the number of men, women, and children who lost their lives in World War II totaled over 50 million. Have they been forgotten? In May 2015, 70 years after the liberation of Europe from Hitler's Nazis, His Holiness Pope Francis addressed an audience of tens of thousands in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican, and we were invited to be there. In tale occasione, affido al Signore per intercessione di Maria Regina della Pace l'auspicio che la società umana impari dagli errori del passato e che di fronte anche ai conflitti attuali che stanno lacerando alcune regioni del mondo, 
tutti i responsabili civili si impegnino nella ricerca del bene comune e nella promozione della cultura della pace. We are so honored to be in your presence and ask if you would bless this album of drawings. It came from the concentration camp in Dachau, Germany, where my father, as a boy, suffered with so many of multiple faiths. Why did two Jewish children of survivors get the blessing? of His Holiness Pope Francis. That warrants an explanation. Who was Arnold Unger and what is the Dachau album? In his own words. I was nine years old and lived with my parents and six-year-old sister Ruth in a beautiful home in Wieliczka near Krakow, Poland. My father was the owner of one of the largest furniture businesses in the area and our family was well known and respected. Then, the infamous horde of Nazis overran our town, disrupted our lives, murdered my parents and little sister, and robbed us of all we had. I managed to escape this gruesome death because I was away in the country at the time. With the aid of our Christian friend, I remained in hiding for a while, but eventually I was discovered and thrown into the Krakow ghetto. There I learned that I am the only survivor of the entire Unger family, approximately 50 people, all, old and young alike, were murdered. How I managed to survive this inferno at the age of nine is still a puzzle to me. Shari will tell you more about her father. But let me tell you how I came to found out, find out about this incredible artifact. Shari is my neighbor, and our daughters, both here tonight, have known each other since kindergarten. Now they're in college. After years of walking to school and greeting each other almost daily, Sherry approached me and she told me the story of her father's album, which had been hidden since after World War II. She asked me to look at the album that was hidden in her bedroom closet. My hands were shaking as I realized immediately that I was looking at possibly one of the most important Holocaust discoveries since the war. The top experts in the field, including, among others, the Dachau Concentration Camp Memorial Site, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, and Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, have confirmed this. Internationally renowned Holocaust expert, Dr. Michael Berenbaum, was one of the first people to see the Dachau album. And he joined us as we traveled to Dachau to begin our investigation. It's very important. It's very important. Um, uh, I've never seen such such a voluminous uh, album like like this. So it's um, yeah, it's a it's a complete work. Yeah. I think it's 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 very moving that something like this turns up after such a long time. Um, and it's it's probably unique. You don't have another comparable piece of memory. I think we began with a mystery. I think we have concluded this first week of research with an even deeper mystery and with a much sadder mystery. This is not a happy ending. That means the only happiness to be taken from this is the fact that the album endures and the album itself bears witness because the people do not. Dachau was the first concentration camp built in the suburbs of Munich. It served as the testing ground and the model for all the camps that followed. Let me give you an overview of this extraordinary artifact. The leather that surrounds it may have belonged to a Nazi SS officer. We have learned that concentration camp prisoners seeking revenge killed Nazi officers and sometimes used the leather of their uniforms to encase various items. On the cover, we find the replicas of Arnold's patches. 148380, 
was Arnold's prisoner number in Dachau. And the red triangle identified him as a Polish political prisoner and not a Jew. Now we know from his documentation that he was identified as Jewish prior to his arrival in Dachau. How did that change and why? This pin is another mystery. We've reached out to the top experts to find out what it could possibly represent. So far, no one seems to know. The inner cover includes the patches of what we've been told may have belonged to a master sergeant in the SS Viking division. What we did not know until recently was the significance of this patch. Edward Black is an author who's written extensively on World War II. He pointed out to us that this patch represented the relationship between the Mufti of Jerusalem and Adolf Hitler. In his book, The Farhud, Roots of the Arab-Nazi Alliance in the Holocaust, he goes into detail about this relationship, which led us to explore an Arab or Muslim connection to Dachau, leading us to the heroic life and tragic death of Nur Inayat Khan, a Muslim woman of Indian descent and an allied special operations agent during the Second World War, who was posthumously awarded the George Cross, the highest civilian decoration in the United Kingdom. She was the first female radio operator to be sent from Britain into occupied France to aid the French resistance. Turned in by a suspected double agent, Khan was arrested in 1943 and transferred to Dachau in 44, where she was tortured and executed. According to historical records, her dying cry was Liberté, Liberté, Liberté. Her story deserves to be forever remembered. The album contains over 250 photographs, some of which have never been seen before. Some of them were taken by the American liberators and show the camp itself and the horrors discovered in this hell called Dachau. If you are sensitive to some of the horrible images from the Holocaust, please, I would respect uh, or expect that you close your eyes now. We would be remiss not to acknowledge these pictures' existence. Many of these images are well known, but somehow they never lose their stunning impact. You can open your eyes now. There are the propaganda photos that were distributed by the Nazis to fool the world into believing that Dachau and the other camps like it were not such terrible places. Look, they had lockers, wonderful facilities, blankets, and pillows in the bunks. There are the images of the Dachau trials. There were trials all over Europe identifying and punishing those who perpetrated these horrible crimes against humanity. There are many more photos that tell a very unique narrative of life after liberation. Rarely discussed is the joy and renewal that followed the liberation for some of the survivors, especially the youngest of them, for they were set on a path to recapture a human existence. Dachau became a displaced persons camp after the war, where survivors and refugees began to rebuild their broken lives. A place that was built for 5,000 people now housed over 40,000 refugees of all nationalities, all faiths. How did they live? How did they survive? How did they find each other? They created associations based on their nationalities. Arnold, being Polish, is found in the photo of the Polish Prisoners Association Committee. We find the American officers in this album, the ones who helped them come back to life. We find many photographs of these American officers with Arnold Unger. Dozens of personal photographs of Arnold in the company of a beautiful girl with whom he seems to have been close. We didn't know who she was and we knew nothing about their relationship but she seemed to be the key to learning more about Arnold and the album. If only we could find her, but how? <laughs> An impossible task, another mystery. But what makes this artifact a singular representation of the interfaith nature of the war 
is that before the viewer even sees the hundreds of photographs, there are 30 pieces of hand-drawn original works of art, 30 pieces of incredibly detailed, masterful drawings. We didn't know who the artist was until we went to Dachau for the first time, and we discovered that he was a Roman Catholic prisoner who survived the war. We learned that his name was Michael Porolski, and his story is now intertwined forever with Arnold Unger's, two men whose life stories can change the way we learn the lessons of the Holocaust and World War II for generations to come. A teenage Jew and a Roman Catholic artist whose experiences, hidden for over 70 years, are now being shared with the world. The most important person in this story is Arnold Unger, Oliver Scholem. And to tell you about her father, I would like to invite to the stage the woman who changed my life forever by sharing this artifact with me. She has become my dearest friend and has invited me to join her and her siblings in sharing this extraordinary artifact with the world. So please welcome to the stage my dear friend and my colleague, Ms. Sherry Unger. Hello, and thank you all for being here. I want to tell you a little bit about my father and his history. Arnold Unger was born and living with his family in Wieliszka, Poland, when the Nazis invaded. He was separated from his parents and his younger sister at the age of nine. Try for a moment to imagine your children and grandchildren in that situation at nine years old. He managed to survive for a couple of years in hiding with the assistance of some Christian friends but after two years of running through forests and hiding in trenches, he was arrested and thrown into the Krakow ghetto. Late in 1942, he was sent to Plushev, the labor and concentration camp that was the subject of Steven Spielberg's landmark film, Schindler's List. After almost two years in mid-1944, he was transferred to Notzweiler, a concentration camp in the Alsatian mountains on the border of France and Germany. In an effort to learn all we could, we visited the ITS, the International Tracing Service in Bad Erlsen, Germany, where 30 million wartime documents are archived. We were able to find my father's documents, and as expected, he was registered as Jewish. A few months later, as the Allied forces were approaching from the west, he was placed on a transport to Dachau. What was shocking to us when we discovered his entry form to Dachau was that he had shed his Jewish identity and was registered as a Polish political prisoner, which actually may have saved his life. How did that happen? Another mystery. When Dachau was liberated, three weeks after his arrival, the US Army personnel that were governing the camp identified my father out of 35,000 survivors as being extraordinary. He was 15 years old at the time, and they chose him to be their office boy and translator. By sheer coincidence, I had discovered a book by Dr. Marcus Smith, the medical officer who was, who was stationed at Dachau for only six weeks after the war. In his memoir, he actually mentions my father by name multiple times. I described some of the youngsters in the camp, handsome, mature Poles, about 15 or 16 years old, all willing workers. Our 15-year-old Jewish office boy, Arnold Unger, weeps copiously. No family left, no place to go. It has been one of the few pleasures here to watch his starved face fill out. His hair begin to glisten, his smile return, his eyes become bright with gladness and joy. He would do anything for us, for all Americans. One officer in particular, Lieutenant Frank O'Reilly, 
was so fond of my father that he made multiple attempts to adopt him. In a letter to my dad two years after his arrival in the States, he wrote, Never think for a moment that I've forgotten about you. On the contrary, in my mind, you're actually an adopted son. Besides helping set up the labor office list of inmates, you were the individual out of 35,000 on whom I concentrated. Why? Because you were pleasant, courteous, on the ball, told us what you wanted without being a pest, and were always ready to help others. God grant, 30 years from now, I'll get a letter from you telling of your family or of your achievements in your chosen field, or, uh, and, I, and then I can say, well, if it hadn't been for our help, Arnold would be. But instead, he has been given the fullest opportunity and has used it to the full. So with this background information, we've speculated that this album which we know was created specifically for my father, was probably commissioned by the American officers who adored him. The Polish inscription on the title page translates as, to be a keepsake forever from times of difficult and long, ca and long captivity. It took approximately a year and a half for the American officers to find the only surviving relatives of our family that had come to the United States prior to the war. And as a result of their efforts, my father arrived in America on February 3rd, 1947, on the SS Ernie Pyle, and lived with his uncles and their families in New Jersey. How I found out about Arnold was one day my father told me that we got to go to New York. Why? Because he got contacted by this Colonel O'Reilly, who was... Uh, He contacted my father and told him he was searching for my father for quite some time and uh, that he had my father's nephew. That's exactly how it came out. And uh, that he was searching for the family of this Arnold Unger and we were the people. So uh, he told my father <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, he wanted to adopt them. That's what he told my father. And I remember going out as a kid to Jamaica, Long Island, to this girl's house. And uh, I was listening to, to the discussion of what was going on, but of course, I was just a kid. And uh, he wanted to adopt them. My father says, no. <laughs> The album was put in a closet and not discussed, which is typical. Many survivors never talked about their experiences, but no matter how they tried to shield their families from the scars of trauma, the scars prevail. How did you know that Daddy had, you know, been in the camps? We knew a lot of things we were never told. We knew not to talk about it. We knew not to ask about it. Same thing's true for the album. For me, somehow I had a sense that it was there. I remember feeling like I was sneaking into the bedroom and deliberately going into the closet, mm -hmm. taking the album down from the top shelf, sitting on the corner of the bed, and starting to look through the album. Daddy's picture on the title page really was stunning to me to see Daddy as a boy in a prisoner's uniform. I remember hearing footsteps and scurrying like mad to get him away because no way did I want to get caught. Because right. I had the sense that I shouldn't be doing what I was doing. I felt that way when I found the album. I have a visual memory of sitting in front of his closet and taking it out of its case and Opening it, and um, I mean, similar to the way you just described, nobody else was around, and um, hmm. I 
I didn't have this reaction at the time. <laughs> but it was scary, it was shocking. And when I thought I might be caught <laughs> looking at it, I quickly put it away. I never told anybody. My father was a brilliant man. He was so special that the local new newspapers wrote articles about him. He grew up and completed his education and tried to live a normal life. He eventually became a successful aerospace engineer who contributed to the design of the landing gear for the Apollo lunar module. He met my mother Ruth, fell in love, got married, had four children of which I am the second oldest. Like all survivors of incredible trauma, the past haunted him from his reparations letter in 1955. Here in America, I have tried to forget the terrible dream of my youth and have built a new life on a moral and human code. It gives me great pain to bring back the horrid memories after so many years of normal living here in the USA. I have difficulty myself believing the story of mass murder to be true, for I have now occasion to be associated with scientists of German origin of whom I could not imagine able to sanction such a terrible crime. But the unchangeable fact remains. My father, mother, and sister are dead, and I myself still suffer ill consequences. On Thanksgiving Day of 1972, my father, Arnold Unger, after learning that our mother had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, could no longer live with his pain and his memories, and he took his own life. My sister, Debbie, who is here tonight, wrote this poem years later. I am 11 years old. Looking into my father's eyes, he looks back at me through broken shards of pain. It is Thanksgiving Day. Standing at the window in my best friend's bedroom, I am curious about the police cars I see in my driveway. An incomprehensible explanation emerges from the garage on a stretcher shrouded in a white cloth. I don't understand what I see when my friend's father suddenly, brutally explains. His stark words, like a blunt knife, plunge mercilessly into my heart. Your father is dead. My mind, terrified, flees the thought. My body struggling to follow. It isn't true. I scream, no, no, no over and over again. Strong arms, more powerful than all the strength in my young body, immobilize me and render me powerless, lifeless, held captive for Thanksgiving dinner. I gorge myself on grief. Our father committed suicide. Our mother passed away two years later and my siblings and I went to live with relatives in Florida. We brought the album with us, tucked it away in a closet, and rarely thought about it. We grew up and went on with our lives, burying our father's history. But the day finally came when the Dachau album had to resurface. You see, to my father, the Dachau album was a visceral reminder of horrors he needed to forget. But to me, while a reminder of my father's pain, it has also triggered an appreciation of what he went through and also of the difficulties faced by millions during World War II and in every violent conflict in the world. With that sense of urgency, I turn to Avi for help. Thank you again for allowing us to share our story. And now I would like to invite my children, Rebecca and Robbie, to the stage to share their thoughts on the grandfather they never knew. It was in the fifth grade that a career in engineering was first suggested to me by my teachers. At that time, I was unfamiliar with the field, but immediately became interested because of the math and science components for which I had already developed a passion. When talking this over with my mom, she told me of my grandfather who, 
after surviving the Holocaust as a teen, went on to obtain advanced degrees in electrical engineering and contributed to putting the first man on the moon. In a letter he wrote appealing to the German government for reparations, he expressed that he found it astounding to work with such high caliber scientists of German origin when he had so recently been persecuted by people of the same nationality who sanctioned such heinous crimes. But despite his past, he was able to appreciate the value in accepting people for who they were, not based on where they came from or what they believed in, but for how they behaved and what they contributed to the greater good. If he could live by that philosophy, how can any of us not? And even after enduring something as gruesome as the Holocaust, he still had the ambition to follow his dreams. His drive inspires me to pursue his, the limitless possibilities awaiting me, and who knows, maybe I'll even help to put the first man on Mars. So this is a really unique situation for us to be in. Even though I am biologically linked to this intriguing and significant project, for me it has always been just a story. I have never met my grandfather, and yet I am still connected to him because of it. I remember walking into my house one day a couple of years ago, and my mom was watching some home movies from her childhood for possible clips for the documentary. Eventually, there was a scene of my grandfather walking around, and in that moment, I realized that this had been the first time that I had ever thought of him as a living being. Other than in that moment, I had only seen still pictures of him. That moment emphasized how important it was for me to be a part of this project, not only to learn more myself, but to also encourage others to be accepting of those that they encounter, regardless of religion, race, or background. The most important lesson I've learned from being a part of this project is that the words you say and your actions towards other people matter. Sometimes you don't know how you will affect people, whether you're perceived positively or negatively, and how then they may affect other people. I never met my grandfather, like I mentioned, and yes, I wish I could have known him, but because of his story and his inspiration, I am motivated to make a difference. I learn something new every single day about my grandfather's story, and that reminds me to be the best person I can be and to strive to make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry, Robbie, and Rebecca, and Debbie, who's here tonight. Another important character in this story is the artist, but we knew nothing about him. We weren't even sure of his name until we went to Dachau. What we knew was that some of the artwork had the name Parolsky. Others were initialed MP, and some were not signed at all. When we went to Dachau for the first time, we received confirmation that his name was indeed Michael Porolsky. He had arrived in Dachau in 1941, and when asked what his occupation was, he said that he was an artist. We also discovered that he was a Roman Catholic, and that's pretty much all we knew. On our subsequent trip to the International Tracing Service, we learned a great deal more about Michael Porolsky. Now, by coincidence, or perhaps divine providence, there were two bureau chiefs of the Associated Press, one from Warsaw and one from Amsterdam, who were at the ITS writing a story about the recently opened archives. We were introduced to them, and they were so impressed with the album and the stories related to it that they sent reporters to Warsaw, to the home that Michael Porolsky had listed in his papers. And what they discovered there was stunning. They uncovered his accepted application to the Warsaw Fine Arts Institute in 1934. They found assorted photographs of him with his family. But even more amazing was the artwork that they discovered in the basement of the family home, works that he had created before the war. These are his artistic beginnings. And it shows how his artwork became more and more intricate we also discovered that he was arrested in 1940 because of this postcard that is now displayed at the Warsaw Museum of Caricature. This is an innocuous piece depicting people standing in a long line. And what it says at the bottom is, first we stand in line for soup and then for bread. For this he was arrested 
and sent to several concentration camps. In 1945, he is liberated from Dachau and he emigrates to Australia. He returns to mainland Europe in 1963 and he wanders around penniless, alone, destitute, and ill. And eventually he ends up in Hereford, England, where he dies in 1989. The Associated Press found that he had died of a tubercular disease and that his occupation at the time was painting bridges. This masterful artist was reduced to painting bridges in order to survive. In the article they wrote that the moment he finished painting a bridge over some river, he had to start again on another bridge over another river a metaphor for a life going nowhere. On February 6th, 1978, he wrote a desperate letter to the International Tracing Service. Dear sirs, while I was a student at the Warsaw Academy of Fine Arts, I was arrested by the Gestapo on June 10th, 1940, and subsequently deported to Auschwitz, Nuyengam, and finally to Dachau where I was kept till April 29th, 1945. At present, I have come to Poland to get some medical treatment. Now, I would like to get some information on whether there is any chance of my getting compensation for the years I was kept in the concentration camps. I have no occupation of any sort. I was unable to resume my studies after all those years in the camps. I have no family, no accommodation, nor the possibility of finding one. I am just by myself and I live from day to day. In view of my age and the condition of my health, I have less and less chance of finding a job. Would you please direct your reply to my temporary address in Poland, yours truly, Michael Perulski. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you are about to see the legacy that makes this album so important. The 30 pieces of artwork created by Michael Porolski, a Roman Catholic master artist from Warsaw, Poland. An entire story with a beginning, a middle, and a tragic end. Each of these pieces has a story to tell, and this collection is essentially an artist's diary, a story of life and death in a camp called Dachau.
extraordinary. There are many mysteries associated with this album. For instance, how did the artwork end up in the album? Did the artist Michael Perolsky know Arnold Unger? They were not contemporaries. Arnold was 15, Michael was 35. Did Michael do this in hiding? Maybe he did it after the war, perhaps. We will never know. Now we've met Arnold Unger, we've met Michael Perolsky, and we've seen the amazing artwork. But one of the greatest mysteries in this album is the girl. Many of the photographs towards the end of the album are of Arnold in the company of this beautiful young woman. But we had no idea who she was. But we knew if we could only find her, maybe she could tell us about her relationship with Arnold and about the people in the photographs. One day, Shari did a Google search for Holocaust survivors in New Jersey, hoping to find out more information about her father. And instead, she found a photograph of this beautiful girl, Sala Zilberstein. This exact same photograph that's in the album. She had written us a story, uh, her story in a book about Holocaust survivors in New Jersey. And it had her married name and the city where she lived and it wasn't too hard to find a phone number. I called the number and a gentleman answered. His name was Ira and he had married this girl, now an elderly woman. I said, sir, I'm going to ask you a question. Please don't hang up on me. Was your wife ever in Dachau? He said, yes, she was there after the war. I said, well, we have in our possession an album that has dozens of photographs of your wife. I said, does the name Arnold Unger mean anything to you? Silence. After a few moments, he said, oh my God, Arnold Unger. He said, I've been married for 40 years, and every time my wife and I have a fight, she says to me, I should have married Arnold Unger. <laughs> The next day, we traveled to New Jersey with our documentary film crew, and we interviewed Sala, Sala Zilberstein. And she gave us details about her relationship with Arnold and how he survived. My name is Sally Zilberstein. Arnie didn't have where to go. So my brother said, he's so young, he has to have a place, and I'm going to request that this is my little cousin, and I will take him. It. Was Arnie your boyfriend? Yes. Yes? <laughs> yeah, I picked him. <laughs> <laughs> I picked him. He was very intelligent, I thought. I thought he was very handsome. Sala Zilberstein. Her brother was named Jacob, a successful Jewish accountant in Radom, Poland. He had been arrested and eventually sent to a camp called Natzweiler. Now, we knew that Arnold Unger was in Natzweiler before he came to Dachau. Is it possible that Jacob and Arnold met there? Three weeks before the end of the war, Arnold goes from Natzweiler to Dachau, where he is suddenly identified as a Polish political prisoner, which probably saved his life. Shortly thereafter, Jacob arrives in Dachau. The war ends, and Jacob, who was responsible for keeping the prisoner list for the Nazis during the war, is assigned the same job for the refugees under the direction of the American officers. And for this, he was provided a house in which to live in the town. According to Sala, Jacob requested that Arnold come live in the house with him. Searching for his family, 
Jacob discovers that his three sisters have survived Auschwitz. And he calls for them, and they come to live with him in the house in Dachau. And that's how Arnold met Salah. There are many photographs of them together in the album, one of which is this photograph of them sitting on a car, holding hands. Now we find out that Arnold and Salah came to America together on the SS Ernie Pyle. They were a young couple, and they loved each other. She went to live with her relatives in Brooklyn. He went to live with his relatives in New Jersey. And apparently, his relatives didn't like the idea that he was going out with a greenhorn, with a survivor. They wanted him to meet a nice American girl. And so this young couple breaks up. Now, we've all been teenagers. And we know what young couples do when they break up. Very often, they take the photographs that they had together and they cut them in half. Well, as we're sitting with Salah, we're showing her the photograph, she says, I just remembered. I have photographs too. And she goes to the back room and she brings out a small plastic bag with half photographs. <laughs> and she takes out her half of this photograph. Shari pulls out her little plastic bag with her father's half photographs, and there we are in New Jersey in the house of Sala Zilberstein, and we took the two halves of this photograph and we put them together. A final reconciliation. Now, one of the most important elements of this project is the documentary film currently in production. Our executive producer, Michael Cantor, and our director, David Novak, are here tonight. You are one of the first audiences to see the trailer of Traces of Arnold, our documentary. Wir gedenken der rund 41.500 Menschen die diesen Ort nicht überlebten. Wir denken auch an die Überlebenden, die durch den Terror und die unvorstellbaren Gräuel, die sie hier erleben mussten, für ihr ganzes Leben gezeichnet waren und sind. I am Sherry Unger Klages. I am here at Dachau for the 70th anniversary of the liberation because my father was liberated from here. The American officers gave my father a custom-made album, which contains 30 pieces of original artwork. We knew nothing about it until after he died and discovered it on the top shelf in his closet in his bedroom. My father committed suicide. He was 42, I was 12. My dad's not here to share his experiences personally. That long stick, one of the evil guards had a nail he drew across. Oh. I still have a mark on my neck. We were marching and, and all of a sudden, 32,000 starving inmates standing there looking at us. I mean, we were just horrified. All these scenes, prisoners had reported to us stealing foods, being beaten, you never see on any photograph. We may have a picture of your father in here. Okay, Maybe that. It. What was your father's name? Dudek. 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 He's in the signature book. On some of them, it says Porolski. Well, who is Porolski? Catholic, Polish, and now his profession had been painter. <gasps> Dachau was known to be a camp for political prisoners. Catholics were imprisoned here. So many millions beyond the Jews were also affected. From the day that Cherry and I learned that the artist was a Roman Catholic, we felt that it was very important to see if we could reach 
the highest levels of the Catholic Church to let them know about this artist's work. I feel small. <laughs> In tale occasione affido al Signore l'auspicio che la società umana impari dagli errori del passato. I'd like to think that he came here to this very spot and enjoyed this tree and these gardens and this view. I was in love with him, and he was in love with me, I guess, but in a childish way. Yeah. Could this be yeah. the tree they're sitting against? Yeah. <sighs> I think he loved it here. The American soldiers had the album created for my father to give him a tool to deliver to the world. And within this one artifact, all of those who suffered in the Holocaust come together. People from all walks of life, all around the world. Catholics, Jews, gays, gypsies, the disabled. This artifact touches all populations. And although his pain prevented him from delivering that message personally, we are delivering the album to the world. is the Dachau Album Interfaith Holocaust Program. What are we trying to accomplish? We must teach generations to come about the inhumanity that we, humans, are still capable of. We have to teach that all people are affected by intolerance and hatred and that the lessons of the Holocaust and World War II are as relevant around the world today as they were 70 years ago. Just turn on the news. Our goal is to teach acceptance, to initiate an interfaith and multicultural dialogue. Using the stories and the images in the Dachau album, we will research and create new academic tools and worldwide exhibitions. And we're very proud to be able to say that we have already accomplished a great deal. We have documented the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Dachau. We were invited to meet His Holiness, Pope Francis. The Library of Congress in Washington, D.C has requested that this album become a permanent part of its World War II collection. We've had two new segments done on the album on NBC6 in South Florida, and we're very proud to tell you that one of those segments has actually won an Emmy Award. And tonight, some of you may have seen in the gallery uh, the organization Book Arts, one of the most significant organizations that recreates artifacts. We're very proud to have them working on recreating the, creating the replicas of this album so that we can give the album to the Library of Congress. Elie Wiesel said, if anything can, it is memory that will save humanity. So we pledge to remember forever. That is the lesson of the Dachau album and why it symbolizes hope for the future. It's about the survival of the human spirit through memory, education, and acceptance. It's about freedom from persecution and genocide. It's about survival, the survival of humanity. Finally, with your support, we can send a very powerful interfaith message of unity, compassion, and acceptance that will affect everyone who experiences the gripping stories that are contained within the Dachau album. Thank you so very much.
We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.